Okay, great. Well, David Welter is our speaker for the September meeting. He began his work as a cabinet setter in for Winnebago way back in the day and did some finished car uh, carpentry work. He got in the College of the Redwoods in 1983 and finished the program up. And then he went into a little co-op with some of the graduates that he graduated with. In 86, he was chosen to be the full-time uh, position with the Krenov program. And he worked there for 30 years uh, with Krenov and the other instructors and students. Retired in 2016 and currently has a small shop in Fort Bragg. So he's, what he's gonna talk to us about tonight is beginnings of the Grinnell program and review uh, some of his work. So David, have at it. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm flattered to have been asked and I hope I can give you something to, something has side and something to mull over and think about while I'm doing this. Um, I think there's no reason that I can't just jump right in on it. Uh, I won't go too much into Jim's uh, old personal life. Um, there's been a recent biography put out by Brendan Gaffney. It's just a great book. Um, Lee Fingerprints. I don't know where you've seen this or not. You're just seeing the screen. But uh, Brendan did a real good job of doing some real research. He found classmates of Jim's at the Malmston School. And it's just a, it's a good story. I mean, Krenoff just had a great background. Uh, and the books that he wrote started out in 75 through 79 or 80. He was working with the last one, mostly a picture book there. In promoting the very first book, Jim was in Santa, came to Santa Cruz. Several woodworkers from here went down there, saw him, saw him give his talk, and he said they kidnapped him. He brought him up to Fort Bragg and did a seminar in a, in a, in a shop. Uh, Brian Lee here back in the corner was the proprietor of that shop. This, the fine woodworking building was the first building that the College of the Redwoods owned in Fort Bragg. Um, as it, at that time, the college offices were an old mortuary, which now is the North Coast Brewing, Brewing Pub. But um, we, the school is no longer under the College of the Redwoods. It's been taken over by a community college nearer to us. Uh, Mendocino College. So College of the Redwoods is history. The very first class. And we're still in contact with many of these people. It's, you know, one of the best things about being involved with that, this class was just how attached people got to, to it, how, how much they got out of it and how much it meant to them, no matter what they did. About well, four years ago, I got an email and photos from someone in Sweden who had this cabinet and uh, wondered if it could be Kranoffs. They thought it was, but um, they weren't sure. So they said they got it in 74 and, and you know, I think it couldn't be anybody but Kranoff. At that time, there wouldn't have been anybody copying him because you know, he hadn't even put out his book yet. So and you, you see, this is a log house. Look at the wall there. So I was pretty sure that is indeed a crown up cabinet, but that's, his wife did not recognize us. Jim was gone by the time this got to the shop, but his wife, Britta, didn't recognize it. Um, let's see. Bummed and I get my notes here. Uh, Jim's process was one of working. It was an evolutionary process. He'd start with a sketch, have a general idea how big it was going to be, and just start mocking it up. 
in stopping, taking a look, make decisions, change if it needed to be. He considered you know, the process creation to be a conversation between his hands, the tools and the material. So, you know, he once said of a cabinet, I just came in one morning and it was done. You know, he liked the idea that he was getting so much out of the piece itself. He wasn't, he'd say, there's no ego. I'm not making this happen. I'm working with it. And, you know, that's somebody said, I'm working on it. He said he worked with it. And this is the cabinet that came from this mock-up. Um, this was in the second year of the class, in my first year. He did not have his bench in the shop at that time, uh, but somebody left left the class and he, he took over the bench and he started working all in the middle of the first semester. And this is the cabinet that came of that. He was pretty energetic. Um, you know, at this time he had been just 60 or so and he daily would find somebody and take him out to the tennis courts so just a few blocks away and go down and hit some balls around. He didn't like to keep score because then you knew he wasn't doing so well. But, just knock the balls around. And like any tool he had that could be modified, some to suit him. He might even notice his shoes, there's holes in his shoes. He'd get new shoes every six weeks and drill holes in them for ventilation. This was an early cabinet when he first came here. It took a little while for him to get his oh, get his bearings. This is a reproduction or a revisiting of one of his favorite cabinets that he had said. The original was made out of lemon wood. This was some really fine Japanese oak that came into the shop and he snurfed that up right away. This, this cabinet is just about done. I think he's working on handles there. And the finished cabinet. He was kind of funny about uh, getting photog photography done. Sometimes a piece would be gone and be no record of it, so that we don't have everything by any means. He generally finished three projects a year. There was always one early fall, in the winter, and then in the spring. And that was in addition to being teaching two days a week and spent a lot of time with students besides his teaching days. Another early cabinet that he did here was another revisitation. He had done this a couple of times in uh, one in Elm and the other one in what he called Oregon Pine, which is fir. This one known as Ash. It's now in the Renwick Museum. Um, a few years ago, the director there called or emailed the shop and wondered if there was a chance that the renter could have one of, one of Jim's pieces. I didn't know of any for sale, but it wasn't nine months later than the owner of this piece said, do you know anybody would like to have the ca this cabinet? Um, somebody else should take care of it. He figured he was a caretaker, not an owner. Well, he wasn't going to give it to the museum, but uh, alumni raised funds to purchase it from the owner and we gave it to the museum. So it's a, it's a, it's a complex piece, curves in two directions. He loved the graphics of, of wood. And he loved showing evidence of tool marks. I, I kind of worked here on this reflection in these ears so you could see you know the gouge marks that he used to scoop out that ear well, he thought he didn't do a lot of sanding he liked to run his hands over the surface that yeah i can feel there's a plane here that did this this was a piece that he started it's similar to the first one i show you horizontal of the legs that swoop up like that. Uh, this was really, he, he started on it, didn't know what he was gonna do, 
put it away and then dragged it out again and went back to work. And it's, it's one of my favorites of the pieces that he did while he was at, at Fort Bragg. I would, he often talked about tension in, in, in forms and you know, the sweep of his legs, it's um, giving life to that cabinet. And if you see, can see those hangers of the glass shelves, you know, that kind of, the dimension of them changes as it goes down. He liked to think of, there was a tension on those supports. It was getting pulled and something's about to happen. And that's part of what gives his work so much life. He called this a walk around cabinet. This is the backside where, where he could load objects in the, side, in the side compartments. He says, who says cabinet has to be against the wall? I like the way this was a veneered cabinet. And I like the way it almost looks like this door is framed with a different wood, but that's just the veneer. He thought, well, if it worked one way, does it work the other? Closed in the ends of this cabinet, this is pear wood and added a stretcher at the bottom. The other one didn't have that curved stretcher. So he was always doing something a little different. You know, when people asked him, well, you're always doing the same thing. And he'd say, well, you're not looking at anything. Another piece that he started put away and then, then dragged out and finished again, a little kind of, Oh, looks like a throwback, doesn't it? Kind of a, um, like the 18th century or 19th century piece somehow. Um, he didn't like to do miters, but he didn't have a choice on this glass stop. As I remember, this, this stop was sawn rather than bent. This was a long time ago, I can't remember. Uh, he did a couple of these music stands in Sweden before coming here, and he did one here too. But uh, again, you can see he changed something. He put the slats in vertically this time. You see if that was any David, you know, difference I would make. What what is that? What what did you call that? Is it a, a music, music stand? stand? And here you see it's in use. Ah, thank you. Okay, uh, it's for for for. A duet, um, Bernie Sanderson, or yeah, Bernie Henderson there played in the Philadelphia Philharmonic. He was a class member at this year. The woman is Marshall, a local uh, concert cello player, and they played this for Jim. In Jim's last days in the hospital, Marsha came to his room with her cello and played him a piece. Again, another, oh, another, another case of him just showing off wood. Yeah, I, sometimes I think his cabinets were just kind of an easel for displaying wood that he thought was attractive. He, he talked about once having a piece of wood that was just, just so beautiful, I just wanted to put it on the wall. One of our more talented individuals was a class member of my first year and another year after that. Um, first one to do uh, marketry in the shop. And um, at that time we didn't have any scroll saws or anything. So he did this all by hand. Well, the window pane looks is a result of the limitation of a fret saw that you have to have a big enough fret saw to turn the piece entirely around. And uh, you know the, the, the dividers in the picture here is evidence of how far he could go with the with the saw, but uh, these these toes on the legs were something new. And Jim was never averse to picking up something that looked good, and he borrowed that for this cabinet a little later. 
uh, and it has these, the cabinet has these, uh, this is veneered too in pear wood. Jim loved his pear wood with these, kind of, we call them belly button pulls. We saw pulls something like that in the very first cabinet I showed you. Um, this is how he dealt with put a curve where the stretcher meets the leg. You know, if this is mitered, or this is a way to avoid short grain in that joint. All the curve is in the, in the leg and there's no short grain to, be break, to break off. If there were short grain in this horizontal piece, that'd be real fragile and would tend to break off. Um, I should have point, I could point out that you almost, I can't think of an instance where he ever put an arch in a stretcher that was at the top of the, of the stand. All, you know, always straight. This is kind of, I don't know. Are you guys seeing this thing at the top? Is this in the way? There's a panel. Uh, this, this cabinet had drawers in either end of the stand. Kind of an excursion to left field here. You know, I have those supports in the broad top. And he, this has a twist to the legs. Can, can you see there's a facet on the face that's kind of flat and dark V there. He'd, he'd just go up to the, he'd lay out, he had the template and draw the curve on a bandsaw and go up there and just freehand uh, 45s into the legs. Maybe you can see on the very end, you know, where he's going to start. But, you know, so he's just, he's just holding it at that angle and kind of twisting as he goes. A lot of David, the work afterwards, but he used that technique quite a few times. David? Yeah. Did, did um, Krenoff use a lot of veneer in his pro projects? In, yeah, he did, um, especially later on. Um, so a, a lot of, and, uh, you know, he used, yeah. It got to be we had a thickness sander and that, that freed them up quite a bit um, for nasty woods. But uh, it, this, this is veneered. I'll try to remember to point out which were veneered. Okay, and did, um, so we had a question, what, who were um, his early influences that he, he incorporated in his designs? Well, um, he was really pretty much an original. There's little things that he picked up from Malmson School, uh, from the old master. And uh, I'll, I'll point out some of that as we go along. Um, but uh, I can't, you know, he did a lot of his work, it is kind of formal looking like, his, Carl Malmsten was a production designer. He designed just hundreds and hundreds of pieces for production. So, you know, it was just real automatic for him. And, I, you know, I think Jim picked up quite a bit, though he hate to admit it. Okay, thank you. And it's kind of, yeah. Carl Malmsten was similar in a way. He spent some time with Sidney Barnsley in England and picked up a lot from, from the Barnsleys. Um, the art, you know, they were English arts and crafts masters, just real elegant furniture. And uh, Sidney's son, Edward, was a near contemporary of Jim's. Anyway, Momsen worked with them for a while, but he didn't want anybody to know that's where he picked up his skills. <laughs> Thanks. Um, th this cabinet is solid wood. It, at least the carcass is. You know. And uh, you know, this is a bit of evidence of 
a liveliness to his work. Um, uh, there's just something about the way this ear flows into the um, suspended stand. He had a good friend working right across from him a couple of years after this cabinet, and uh, the friend wanted to reproduce the cabinet. And Jim was right there helping them. They were, good, you know, Jim gave him a hand whenever he could. And this is that second cabinet by the student. And, you know, it just doesn't have the same life as Jim's. Let's go back. The top of Jim's post are slightly tilted. They're higher above the stretcher than the second one. And I, you know, somehow this just looks flat in comparison. Uh, there's that tension and, and life to so much of Jim's work. Another old piece. Again, you know, there, these poles are sprung. They're, they're about to fly off, you'd think. There, there's just tension to it, life. This one had, was oak and uh, hickory. Hickory can be a difficult work, wood to work, but um, it's beautiful when it's done. Uh, 